I'd like to welcome Dr. Emma Patchwood. Emma is a Stroke Association funded research fellow at the University of Manchester. She leads the Wellbeing After Stroke study on a group therapy that aims to help with depression and anxiety after stroke. So let's please welcome Emma. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone at home um, and in the room, of course, but everyone online as well. I'm really honoured to be here to um, highlight some of the many ways that Stroke Association Research is supporting mental health after stroke. And I wanted to thank the donors, um, both in the room and online. Um, I really hope that we inspire you to um, keep supporting stroke research. Right, so I am a research psychologist based up in Manchester. I've been working in stroke research and brain injury since um, 2006. Um, and I have a long-standing partnership with the Stroke Association. They have um, funded my uh, PhD that started back in 2011. And they have uh, either directly or indirectly in, um, funded all of the postdoctoral work that I've done. So essentially the last 12 years of work that I've done wouldn't have been possible without Stroke Association funding. So I'm very, very proud to be here as an ambassador for them tonight. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about teamwork and collaboration tonight. Teamwork really does make the dream work as everyone said already. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to mention everyone that I work with, but I really did want to give a special mention to uh, Professor Audrey Bowen, who I've worked with very closely since the start of my research career. Anyone who knows Audrey knows that she's a fantastic person and researcher, and I'm very grateful to call her my, my colleague and my friend. So thank you for everything, Audrey. Please don't cry. <laughs> okay, so who am I? Well, um, this is just an excuse to show you some cute baby pictures of me. This is exactly the response I wanted to garner in the room to help me feel slightly less nervous and discombobulated up here. Um, so I wanted to share a story with you about my childhood. Um, Growing up, we lived next door to an elderly guy named Frank. And I didn't know this at the time when I was a kid, but Frank was a stroke survivor. He could still walk, but his speech, his um, mood, and his thinking was really severely affected. And I'm really ashamed and sad to admit this, but as a child, Frank used to scare me. Um, and when he came up, because I couldn't make sense of him. So when he used to come over for help from my mum and dad, I'd just run away from him and I'd just go and get my mum and dad. And, for me, I mean, it makes me feel really sad, but also it just raises, um, you know, says how important it is to raise awareness of these issues and improve support for these kind of hidden consequences of stroke that are very prevalent and absolutely devastating. So now that I'm far from being that cute little kid, um, what do I do for work? Well, um, I do, well, I try to do very applied research that um, is often about how do we improve long-term support for people after stroke. As we've heard tonight, the stroke recovery journey is years, not months. Um, so that often means doing or working towards large-scale pieces of research that generate robust evidence to help us understand what's, clinical, what's clinically and cost-effective so that we can improve um, services and actually really have an impact. Um, I also try to deal with, um, do some capacity building, so that's working with potentially new generations of stroke researchers. That usually comes through supporting postgraduates and, and their masters and their PhD students. And here are some of the, just the wonderful students that I have had the pleasure of working with. And I'm gonna hammer this one. Uh, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I am definitely not an island. I work with some fantastic um, researchers clinicians, service providers, and really importantly, service users. And I want to spend a bit of time saying more about that. Um, so it's been really pivotal for all the work that I've done over the years. And here are just some of the stroke survivors and carers that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, there are many different ways of trying to get stroke survivors' voices in research. And it's key to all the research that I've done is that we've tended to set up these dedicated study-specific groups of people affected by stroke who we um, meet with regularly. They become our collaborators and our colleagues. They help us design and deliver the work that we do. They help us understand the data that we collect, uh, interpret our findings, and tell others about what we do as well. Um, 
And this kind of working um, with stroke survivors, it like working with any specialists, because they are they are specialists, they are experts by experience. It takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of time and energy to do this well. Um, but it really has great rewards. And when we listen to stroke survivors' voices in research, it really changes what we do and, and the way that we do it. And Stroke Association really get this. Um, they know that this isn't about tokenism. It's not just about sort of asking for some opinions and then not really changing what you do. Um, and that's one of the many reasons why I like working with Stroke Association as a funder. So now I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the research that I've done um, and um, that, that wouldn't have been possible without stroke survivors as collaborators and Stroke Association as funders. So there's a broad variety of things that, um, that we've done over the years. Um, we've developed tools and processes to help us measure outcomes, uh, measure what matters to people when we're trying to understand if a rehab, is, rehab intervention or some support that we've provided has actually been effective um, from the point of view of the people that we're trying to help. Now, that might seem really obvious, but it's not always done in, in clinic or in, in research. Um, and actually, understanding and measuring whether something has been effective is really tricky science. Um, we've also done some work around... Um, post-stroke reviews. So clinical guidelines tell us that we should be seeing people at regular intervals after stroke, six weeks, six months, and annually thereafter, and be asking them, what needs do you have? How have they changed? What support can we give you to meet those needs? Um, but there wasn't really much guidance around how we should be doing these reviews and what we should be asking. So um, research led by people like Pippa Terrell and other fantastic people that I, I can't even think about now because I'm nervous. Um, I, I've supported this work um, to look at, uh, to develop something called the Greater Manchester Stroke Assessment Tool, or GMSAT. And that is essentially a toolkit that provides uh, professionals with a way of doing these reviews in a very holistic and patient-centred way. And it's now one of the most widely used tools nationally for delivering post-stroke reviews. Again, wouldn't have been possible without Stroke Association funding. We've also done big research, big trials around um, how we best identify and support the needs of informal caregivers. Um, these are people who are often doing a lot of labour after stroke, as we've heard from Jason, um, but their needs are often neglected. And so we've done big work in that area, which I won't have time to get into, but all of our research findings, our tools and our processes, we make sure that they're freely available online. Um, so I'm happy to talk to people after this. Um, but we want, we want our findings to actually be used by you guys and have an impact. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time now talking in a more depth about what, I, what we actually did and what we found on, on, on my latest piece of research called uh, Waters, or Wellbeing After Stroke. So we've recently finished this piece of work and we've circulated um, an easy access report on findings to all of our research participants and anyone else interested. And if you go to our YouTube channel, you can hear a reading of that report for anyone with accessibility needs. Um, but why did we do the project? So as we've heard tonight, we, we often are quite poor at supporting mental health after stroke. And it tends to be that you have to be at a crisis point before we'll give you some support. You have to be clinically anxious or depressed. Um, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could offer people some kind of intervention that helped them psychologically adjust to the inevitable suffering that stroke is likely to bring and, um, you know, hopefully prevent a mental health crisis down the line. And supporting adjustment after stroke is the number one research priority for life after stroke, for, um, according to organisations like the James Lind Alliance, who you may have heard of. Um, but there's lots of challenges to doing this. And one of the things is that we don't have evidence-based interventions to support adjustment. And we don't have a workforce to provide these interventions. Um, so that's, that's where we started with Waters. Acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, is a really promising psychotherapy in this space. Um, ACT includes a lot of different tools and strategies to um, help people accept their reactions, their feelings, and their emotions, and be present. Um, so it does include mindfulness, as we heard, heard about from Maggie, which is a really powerful tool. It's one of the tools in the, in the ACT toolkit. Um, it also helps people 
um, identify their core important values. What's really important for you to live a valuable life and how can we help you move in a valued direction in your life? And how can we help you take action towards meaningful goals that are important for you? And, and one of the things that we're really trying to target in ACT research is um, something called psychological flexibility. This is the power to be resilient in the face of adversity and hopefully ensure good mental health even when circumstances are changing and challenging. So there were a lot of different things we were trying to do in Waters, a lot of different work packages and questions that we had to ask. But we started with a development phase because we wanted to see, um, well, first of all, we set up a multidisciplinary team, that collaboration again, and, and, a small, and a dedicated group of stroke survivors. And then we got to work to, to develop some stuff that we thought would be useful. Um, so we wanted to develop this intervention that was based on ACT, that could be delivered to groups because, we've, as we've heard from Mark, we know that groups have this sometimes this ed added extra magic when it comes to well-being. So we wanted to look at group interventions based on ACT, and the pandemic happened whilst we were doing Waters as well. So then we had to think about can it be remotely deliverable as well? Can we make ACT accessible and remotely deliverable for um, so that we could work dis even though we couldn't see people in person? And we wanted to tackle this tricky issue of the workforce. So um, usually something like ACT would be delivered by clinical psychologists, but there's just not enough of them to reach people. And what's the point of having an intervention that works if we have no workforce that could actually reach communities and deliver it in practice? So then we wanted to say, you know, ask the question of, can we um, upskill a willing and abundant workforce uh, that would mean that we could um, have reach into the community if this proved to be effective. Um, and then we moved to a testing phase, which was a sort of proof of principle kind of work to see whether anything like this was actually feasible for delivering in practice. Um, so the questions we had here were, you know, will stroke survivors actually want to take part in this? Can we recruit them? Can we retain them? Can we actually deliver these interventions with our trained staff and can we deliver them to protocol as planned and is it safe? Can we collect the necessary data that we would need to help us understand if something like this has been effective? And then what sort of feedback can we get from people to get a richer understanding of their experience of being involved in something like this and you know, how we make improvements and move forward to bigger research? So, um, our co-development phase culminated in the Waters intervention and the workforce training programme. So this is delivered over, the, the, the intervention itself for stroke survivors is delivered over nine weekly sessions using Zoom video conferencing. Um, the sessions themselves, there's a very detailed protocol for what a session looks like. They're highly structured, they involve all the components of ACT, but they are script informed. And the reason for that was to try to make sure that the groups were consistent, were replicable when we moved forward. And also it, it had the added bonus of helping non-expert staff, people who hadn't experienced delivering ACT before, it had the benefit of helping them deliver it in a structured way. Um, it also includes audio-visual resources and a client workbook to support engagement and, um, and accessibility as well. And it includes certain like psychoeducation strategies for helping people deal with the common problems after stroke, like word finding problems, fatigue, forgetting, things like that. And then we moved on, once we developed it, we moved on to uh, training our staff and then testing out the approach in practice. So um, in a nutshell, our testing phase, we ran three of these intervention groups with 12 stroke survivors and one carer between August and December 2021. And every group was facilitated by two different staff members, trained staff. We recorded all of our sessions to help monitor adherence and actually see, are we doing what we planned? We measured mood and well-being before and after groups and then at three and six month time points as well post, post intervention. And we also did interviews and focus groups to help us understand experiences more richly. And what I can tell you is that we had excellent attendance. We didn't have any drop out, dropouts. Um, we had good response rates to our surveys. And we could deliver this intervention as planned and safely. Um, but what more rich feedback did we get? Well, the staff told us they enjoyed um, 
they enjoyed really learning this approach. Um, they found it time consuming, but they were highly motivated to deliver something like this because it, um, they really felt it'd be beneficial for stroke survivors. And um, their confidence in delivering this approach and their skills to deliver it really grew rapidly over time. And that, that bodes well for if you want to scale up this research. Stroke survivors found the groups acceptable and positive. Um, it could be hard or upsetting at times to talk about their emotional well-being, but it was actually in being supported to talk about that that the biggest breakthroughs could come and the perspective shifts that helped them actually feel better. Um, and they usually gained something from the group, some kind of tool or strategy that they were using in their everyday life to improve their well-being. And they gave us, but staff and stroke survivors gave us a lot of feedback, constructive feedback about how we can improve this going forward to make it more accessible, think about when we offer this, how we deal with endings better, how we support group dynamics. Um, I'll end on this quote, which really touched me. Um, if it wasn't for the water study, I don't know where I'd be in my mental issues, mentally or physically. Um, I'm pretty much out of time, but I'll just tell you that we, we're fairly confident that we aren't we, we managed to do everything that we set out to do and that we answered all our research questions. So in terms of what's next, well, we've got this intervention that we think has some good proof of principle that could help people psychologically adjust. Um, and we want to move forward and, and test it further. And I'm really happy to say that we've got some funding to do this from the Stroke Association, no less. No less. I'm so happy that they're continuing to support wellbeing after stroke. So I'll say thank you for listening. And um, I'll leave you with this little message from our two of our stroke survivors and um, Hannah Foote, our PhD student, to say... Thank you for supporting our research. Thank you very much.